anybody wants to raise before I drive on. Questions anybody wants to raise, things they want me to cover, otherwise I'll just carry on. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to run through probably for about 40 45 minutes and open it again for right? anything. Sure. Um, I thought I'd start off with this quote. It actually turns out not to be Mark Twain, it turns out to be some obscure Canadian, but that wouldn't make it memorable, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure Mark Twain would have said this if he thought of it, if it's attributed to him, so I feel okay about it. Um, the things which get us in trouble are actually where we thought we were safe. Um, but that also relates to innovation. It's, it, it's outliers are more important than dominant patterns. And the trouble is most research techniques get rid of outliers. And so you start to see from those narrative maps that outliers are part of what we're looking for. In fact, times we're specifically looking for outliers because they're evidence of, of new thinking. Right? But it's got to happen on a disclosive basis. It can't happen through conversation because people can form in conversation very quickly. Yeah, they won't stand out. Yeah, they won't take risks. Now, if we look at, this is the robust resilience side of it. Um, most people assess risk using the bell curve. Um, I've only drawn one half of it here. Uh, type of Gaussian distribution. So here I'm looking at the probability of outcome against the range of possible outcomes. But if you look at risk assessment, the way it's done, the assumption is that provided you cover off everything within the center of the distribution, you've done all that can be reasonably expected of you. The tail is very shallow, so that's called a low probability of potentially high impact event. But it's not reasonable to expect you to cover that off in advance. Everybody familiar with that concept? Okay, the trouble we got is in the natural systems, you don't get many bell curves. You're more likely to get what's called a power law or a Pareto distribution, type of Pareto distribution. If I do a double log scale of size against frequency, I get a straight line. It's not straight at the top and there are reasons for that. That's actually um, earthquakes. Yeah, there are a lot of small earthquakes, a small number of large earthquakes. There are a lot of small software errors, a small number of large software errors. A lot of small terrorist outrages, a large, small number of large terrorist outrages. You'd be amazed how many stuff conforms to this. Right? Now, the trouble is, if I take a Pareto distribution and overlay it on Gaussian, I get what's called a fat tail probably fatter than I've drawn it there. I really need to change that slide. Uh, what that means is my low probability event is probably a medium probability event. When we presented this to peer review about three years ago, um, I called it the New Orleans Levy's problem. People assumed that flooding was Gaussian when actually it's Pareto. So the so-called one in several hundred years possibility was one in every several decades possibility. And they kind of like got it wrong. And that's generally true. <coughs> you can see evidence of this. You look at the work of Didier at the University of Zurich, um, he's done a huge amount of that with power laws to actually look at financial catastrophes yeah, and how they come about. Um, now, this has consequences for governance. Because if you're in a power law universe, then the chance of failure is very high, and the cost of preventing failure is unsustainable. So if we take all the nonsense of airport security, your chance of being in an aircraft which is bombed by a terrorist is significantly less than a road accident in rural Wiltshire, let alone Johannesburg. All right? But the money we spend on trying to prevent it is out of all proportion. Out of it, it's not very effective. I mean, sorry, I'm an expert in this field. I've spent the last 50 years carrying around a vital of dead liquid and an alarm clock, and it's only been picked up once on security screen. Uh, it is not difficult to get a bomb onto a plane if you really want to. The real prevention is, well, there's two aspects of terrorist prevention. One is stopping people becoming, wanting to be terrorists in the first place. That's actually where the lowest energy cost produces the biggest effect. But then actually you've got to detect the probability so you can look differently. Now this is called, I'll mention this, we may go into it later, it's called anticipatory alerts. You can't predict the future, but you can trigger human beings to a heightened state of alert when the plausibility of a catastrophic event is higher. That's the work we're now doing on abuse of children or abuse of elderly patients in care homes. We can't predict it because it's, too, it's, it's a very rare event, but we can predict the dispositional state is shifting to the point where it's more plausible it would happen. Okay? And again, that's starting to use technology to augment human decisions rather than replacing it. 
It's also a key innovation technique as well. If you can actually build, let me, I'll go through it because it's a useful one. And I'll talk about child abuse first, then you can see where we go from medical illness. The problem we've got with child abuse in the UK is, well, it's not a problem, we don't have much of it, which is actually good news. The trouble is every time we do, it hits the press. And every time it hits the press, the government conducts an inquiry whether it should be blamed. And then they write processes and procedures to prevent that case of abuse ever happening again. This is all well intentioned, right? The trouble is that case was never going to happen again. Next time it would be something different. And the result of which the reporting burden on social work has gone up to the point where 80% of their time is spent filling out forms. Which means they spend less time in the houses. So actually abuse goes up. And you've now got a culture which is all about if your forms are filled in, you won't get blamed. Yeah? Rather than a culture which is we've got to stop children getting abused. And so we now flip that completely. A really interesting project. So what we're now doing is instead of social workers filling that form, this is based on work we did with the US military in Afghanistan, we said if you keep your field notes up to date, same thing I talked about water engineers, you know, six triangles. Take a picture, write something down, draw a picture, put it on the six triangles, really fast capture. You don't have to write a patrol report. We got 100% compliance. Now, if you don't know it, you know, patrols in Afghanistan were on 18 hour patrols. Yeah? And if you, yeah, the, the, the medical stuff in Afghanistan is scary. We're, we're currently positioned over 50% of squaddies will have to have knee replacement drugs by the end of their 30s um, because of the impact stress of the weight they're carrying with the body army and everything else long-term medical costs to do. You throw that prop forwards. I mean, if you become a prop forward, you know all sorts of bad things that can happen to you on arthritis, right? I'm sorry, I was number seven. We always regarded the guy on the inside with pity, but they were very useful. Right? <laughs> um, so what we're doing is social workers now don't have to write reports. If they actually write or capture something before and after each visit, but they can also get the kid or the parents to speak a story and index their own story, which is ethically more powerful. So we're getting, you know, you think about this from a statistical point of view, we're getting mass observations in the field. We're not reliant on people writing a report when they get back to the office. And now the same was true on the American military work. So we've got mass observations from company commanders. We've got that data available in real time. We're not waiting for the reports to be written in military intelligence to assess them. And we can overlay the human metadata on the machine metadata, because we've got sensors. In, in just in disease management, we can account for something like 80% of the variation in oxygen take up in chronic pulmonary care by the way people interpret stories about how they feel. Now, and that's having major implications for chemotherapy and everything else. So you get the principle? Okay, what we're then doing is we're creating training data sets. Uh, we could just wait for four or five years for enough children to be abused, but that's not really ethical. So we're creating training data sets from actual cases where we present the data to naive social workers who don't know the outcome to interpret it. So we're kind of like creating, it's not as good as real data, but it's close. Um, and then once we've got that together, we know which cases produce an adverse outcome and which didn't. So we reinterpret the same data with the benefit of hindsight. So now we give the same data to experts. They don't see the naive index. They may only see the data, but they know it produced an adverse effect. They reinterpret it. It's then a very simple bit of mathematics, not that simple, use DNA mathematics. But what it actually allows you to do is to say, when a social worker goes into a house, the kid tells a story, indexes the story, goes over a threshold level, which lights up a symbol on the screen, which says, stay in this house and ask more questions. And that's called an anticipatory vote. Because you're using past data as a fragmented, and this is a key principle of complexity, finely grained material, self-interpreted by mass observers. Yeah, to actually create predictive patterns which will actually say, spend more time and look at this. Now that's what we're now looking at on safety, it's what we want to look at on innovation. You build in patterns of past observations which produce innovative things, and you monitor current observations to see if you get the same results. The good news is you've also got better monitoring. So your monitoring system becomes your alert system, becomes your innovation system, becomes your knowledge system. And the reason is you stop trying to catch things at too structured a level, you've captured raw observations with high abstraction indication so that things can combine in different ways. And that mirrors the way the human brain works. Yeah. 
The way we actually make decisions is we do a four or five percent beta scan, and then we do something called conceptual blending. So we half remember our own things, and we remember vicarious stories of other people, and we blend them together to come up with a unique form of action. Yeah. So in the military system, we've got company commanders, we've got American warfare indexed by the historians, and we've got development sector stories about things you can do to change things without killing people. If you don't know, it's in small group command, which is an area where I'm working at the moment. And nobody understands small group command other than the captain, as far as I can find. Corporals are making decisions which have implications for world politics. Mm. Yeah. So actually, the ability for them to say, if I knew the answer to this, I'd place it in this triangle here and that triangle there, and get recall from those three databases, and then blend them together to come up with a unique form of action. See how we also do innovation? You're constantly getting fragmented things associated with real-time situations, so your brain blends them together in novel ways. You're trying to avoid linear processes of knowledge retention. Yeah, the massive mistake in knowledge management was codified databases and taxonomies. I mean, taxonomy rhymes with taxidermy in the UK and produces the same effect, right? <laughs> so, uh, coming back to this, all right? So I'm going around diversions on this, but fundamentally, We've now got a problem because the cost of preventing failure is too high. Therefore, we have to switch our strategy. Our strategy now comes, instead of preventing failure, we actually want to trigger it earlier if we can. That's the point about small parallel safety fail experiments. Yeah. If you are actually in a complex adaptive system, everything you do produces unintended consequences. So actually, you're ethically responsible for those consequences, even though you couldn't have predicted the individual one. This is actually really important in terms of government. Yeah. So if in Europe we make some massive you know, financial change for European, and it produces an unintended consequence in Africa, Europe is responsible for that change. They couldn't have predicted the change, but they knew there would be unexpected consequences. That's the one guarantee. Mm. Yeah. Now that has major implications. It means you have to create systems which are resilient. Um, it also means you do lots of small interventions early, so you have small unintended consequences, so you can recover fast. Yeah? Because actually they're, going to be, they're always going to be nasty. Sometimes they may be beneficial, but they'll always be nasty to some extent. Yeah? So early detection, fast recovery, and speedy exploitation, and that's the plus side, become key. Which actually means you need to be sensitized to the fact that you are going to fail, not be in a culture where you're not allowed to doesn't mean that you tolerate failure, which is culpable, but if people have followed the rules or broken the rules and followed the heuristics, they don't get punished. Mm. And where you do parallel safe-to-fail experiments, you make sure that the experiments contradict each other, so some of them are doomed to fail. Yeah? And we've actually done experiments on this in Scandinavia. So now managers, you know, look at a problem, what's complicated, what's complex? If it's complicated, engineer a solution. If it's complex, Anybody with a coherent hypothesis about something which might work gets a small amount of money to run a safety fail experiment. Short life cycle, low cost, low resource. If at the end of the year, 60% of your experiments haven't failed, you don't get your bonus. So we're not, puni we're not punishing failure or rewarding failure, we're punishing failure to experiment broadly enough. And there's a fascinating human consequence when we do this Managers would then find somebody and give them money to achieve their failure target. <laughs> what was fascinating is most of the people they picked and gave money to, expecting them to fail, succeeded in unexpected ways. Because actually those people didn't fit the normal pattern, so they thought they'd fail. But you see what we said, we're managing a complex ecology. We can't engineer the solution. Um, and resilience, as I said, the key thing on resilience is to survive changed, not to survive unchanged. Now, so to give you my favorite philosophical dilemma, right, this is the first essay I wrote when I started to do philosophy at university. Sorry, philosophy is a fascinating subject. I've spent six months of my life trying to decide how you tell the difference between a wink and a blink. <laughs> yeah, it's called the problem of intentionality. Look, it's got major consequences. If you get it wrong in a bar late at night, you get your face slapped. If you get it wrong in international politics, there's a difference between war and peace. Intention of, in, in, human beings have habits of attributing intentionality after the event if something works. 
and saying it's accidental how could the event if it didn't. So it's, it's a huge philosophical problem. Right? <laughs> we, we like these sort of things, right? Um, but the other one I love was the ship of Theseus. Now, if you remember the story, Theseus is the guy who slayed the Minotaur. Now, so the Cretes, the Evander, sacrifice to the Athenian youth every year. Yeah, the prince actually goes, now goes as one of the kids. They go into the labyrinth. Um, Ariadne saves him because she falls in love with him, so she gets Ariadne's thread. Yeah? And he slays the Minotaur, gets that. He abandons Ariadne on the way back on an island. I mean, people forget about that part of the story, but never mind. Comes back to Athens, he's now a hero. The ship is now an artifact of huge significance, the ship of Theseus. So it's put in the air, an enterprising dock owner buys the ship of Theseus, puts it in the dock, and sells access to it at 25 drachmas a day you know, as a historical artifact. And he gives the maintenance contract to his brother in the next dry dock. And his brother deeply resents the fact that he's now a servant. So every time he takes an old plank out of the ship of Theseus and replaces it with a new plank, he keeps it. And 10 years later, he reassembles all the old planks and says, I've got the ship of Theseus. <laughs> and the problem you're given is which is the ship of Theseus. It's a great problem to get you thinking, because it's a problem of identity. Right? Now, the answer I wrote to my brother is I got an A, or I it was cool. I said, well, actually, if it's a historical artifact, the second ship is the ship of Theseus. If it's a ship, then the first ship is the ship of Theseus. Because the concept of identity of an active ship is that you can replace everything, whereas a historical artifact is different. And then my findings are, this got me the A+, plus, all right? And I said, I've got no bloody idea where the change takes place, all right? Which was probably the right answer, all right? Yeah. Now, identity is change over time in the human system. And the trouble is, what we're doing is we're locking down definitions of the present, mm -hmm. which actually reduce resilience. Thank you for the comment. Okay, so if I want to take that, um, what I'm now doing is I'm taking the dot plots, but I'm, the bigger ones have bigger impact. This is from work of Max Brasso, who tragically died two or three years ago. So basically, remember, at the top of the model, it didn't follow the power law. That's because that's a Gaussian universe. It's a domain where many things have happened in the past, which are going to repeat in roughly similar ways in the future. So I can use the past to predict the future. And that means I can accurately assess probabilities. Yeah, many things in the past, similar things in the future. I've got a many-to-many -many relationship. I should be able to estimate the probability of future events. I should be able to predict and manage an outcome. And just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with outcome-based management in an ordered system. There's everything wrong with it in a complex system. Mm. So if I move further to the right, now the number of things which have happened in the past, which will happen the same way in the future, are going down. The number of things which might happen in the future is going up. So the relationship is becoming asymmetric, which means the best I can do is assess what is possible. And the domain of what is possible is much bigger than the domain of what's probable. So that's where people do scenario planning, contingency planning, tonal possibilities. All of those techniques, with both probable and possible, are hypothesis or adaptive based. So the concept is I have a hypothesis based on things I've observed, I test if the hypothesis works again in the future. We're familiar with that scientific method. It doesn't apply to management textbooks, by the way. Yeah. They actually, I mean, there are two approaches on management textbooks. One is you go and study things, yeah, and then you do a correlation. So you find 20 companies who do good things, yeah, they help to be successful. You identify those things those companies do in common, yeah, and you do a correlation and then you create a recipe and say, if you do these things, you too will be successful. Everybody familiar with that approach? Mm -hmm. Notice they never test whether their theories work the next time around, so they don't get the scientific measure. And that's the confusion with correlation with causation. Now, if 20 successful companies have managing directors with regular bowel movements, it doesn't follow that actually your recruitment policy should be based on observing the toilet habits of management trainees, right? Correlation doesn't lead to causation. <laughs> And the other problem we've also got is people have a pet theory. So we've got a new management textbook out which people are seizing on based on spiral dynamics. Anybody come across spiral dynamics? It's up there with NLP as to one of the two great pseudosciences of the modern generation, right? The idea is you have ascending levels of consciousness and civilization, which is dubious history, but when you apply it to individuals is new age mumbo jumbo. Yeah? Um, so it used to be turquoise with the highest level of consciousness, and now they've created jade. 
So if you're at jade level, you can't expect anybody to understand you because they haven't reached the same level of consciousness. <laughs> I remember getting told once that, you know, by Don Beck, who, by the way, claimed that he turned south, you know, it hadn't been as far as the dynamic, South Africa would not come out of apartheid. I mean, that's the claim. Right? And as far, that's the big spark that I'm saying will work, which is crazy. Right? Remember the conference, he said, you don't understand me because you haven't achieved turquoise status, you're only a blue. <laughs> which is a classic New Age argument, so our badges made proud to be brown, right? And got people to wear to them. And then he said, well, actually, you don't understand spark dynamics because brown isn't the color. And I said, well, that was the whole point, but never mind. You <laughs> should never use irony on Americans. They don't understand this. <laughs> But the point is, you've now got, you know, there's his latest book come out, which is all about the teal organization. So it's a classic, you know, a string of platitudes, you know, gathered together with a few cases where they've selectively chosen the cases to justify the theory. And they call that science. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the trouble. Most of the management textbooks, you, you get them, you, you succeed by stringing together platitudes that nobody can challenge and associating them with partial understandings of other cases which actually you haven't investigated properly. Yeah, and that, that's a major, major problem with social science, which is the way it works. Either way, sorry, I shouldn't go on that for the gang here. But what they're doing is it's a hypothesis or inductive-based approach. Okay? Now the trouble is if I move further to the right, we get a problem. Because now I'm doing what Jim March in organizational science famously called the problems of samples of one or less. The number of things which have happened in the past, which are going to repeat the same in the future, is, is minor. But the number of things which might happen in the future is approaching infinite. So I now have to deal with anything which is plausible. And the domain of plausible is much higher than possible and higher than possible. And I can't have a hypothesis because a hypothesis will automatically filter what I look for. Mm. Okay. So that is where we move into a new approach to research, which is called abductive or non-hypothesis research. Abduction is the great contribution of American logicians Abduction is what's the most plausible connection between apparently unconnected things. And the big issue is how do we objectify abduction, which is what I've been working on for the past 10 years. So how do I say that your linkage is more accurate than your linkage? Yeah, because actually the fact we naturally think abductively, we naturally make unexpected connections, which makes us hugely inventive as a species, but makes us prone to conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, that's the downside. And the way you do it is by mass observations. Remember I talked about, you know, identifying the situation on ISIS for a thousand people, looking at how they index it? That's how you objectivize abduction. Sorry, abduction. The other way, this is what we do in social systems, and this actually is developed from constructive theory in physics. Constructive theory in physics says you look at what's possible within the known laws of the universe, then you look at what has the lowest energy cost of replication within those laws and assume that that will happen. Now, I'm now working that on ISIS, because ISIS has a lower energy cost of replication than Al-Qaeda. And the way you handle ISIS is not to challenge it directly, but if you do that, because it's got a low energy cost of replication, it will mutate and spread very quickly. In fact, the scenarios I've been working on for what happens in terms of London are really scary. What I need to make is I need to actually make it more ideological. Yeah? So its energy cost of replication goes up, so something else comes into its place. This is actually huge potential on this, right, in terms of where we do change. So what are the what are the bounds determined by natural science? What's the lowest energy cost within that? How do you change the energy gradient? Which means faced with conditions of extreme uncertainty, you say, what does biology tell us? What does cognitive neuroscience tell us? What does physics tell us about what is the range of what is possible? And then within that, what has the lowest energy cost of replication? And that way you cope with uncertainty. And that's not an inductive method of research. That's an abductive method of research. And it actually gives you higher confidence under uncertainty because the natural science is validated, so you've actually got a base from which to work which is not inductive or hypothesis based. Now that, as a method, is key to invention because invention is abductive, not inductive. It's a difference between incremental innovation and eureka innovation. And the preconditions, actually is interesting, are starvation, pressure, and perspective shift. If you put human beings under extreme stress, but not stress to the point where their life is threatened, yeah, you get them to see the world differently by presenting novel things in different ways, and you, yeah, you get rap rapid innovation. Now, a famous film on this, um, uh, Apollo 13. 
Now, you may remember, you know, this, this point. Have everybody seen the film? Mm -hmm. I ended up watching it three times. I, I, I did three flights to Australia and back in Qantas over, over six weeks. So I, ran, I got to the point where I watched the Spice Girls movie. I was getting that desperate for entertainment. So <laughs> I, and just by huge coincidence, then discovered one of the Spice Girls was in the seat next to me. All right, So that was an interesting experience. <laughs> it's a world of coincidence, so I don't know it works. Um, but I, I watched Apollo 13. It's one of those movies you can watch several times. So there's a point where they draw on the blackboard and they say, look, at this point they ran out of oxygen. So they put all the engineers in the big factory and say, this is what they've got, produce something. And they produced this Heath Robinson contraption. And I still remember, and you know, it's, it's a brilliant thing by the actor. He basically says, the instruction comes up, tear the cover off the manual and fold it into a tube. And he said, the manual's no bloody use anyway, right? It's where it was up. Right? And the point is, starvation of resource, pressure of time, perspective shift, there ain't any other way of dealing with this. You get radical innovation. Right? It's interesting if you look at Sassol, which is a good example of this. You know, one of the things that apartheid did to Sasol is forced them into radical innovation. And the thing which depresses the hell out of them is they're now trying to conform with American management techniques and focus on one thing. And one of the main engines of innovation in South African history has been destroyed yeah, by basically an engineering approach, a management engineering approach in terms of the way it works. I checked nobody was from Sasol before I said that. Perhaps I did some occasions as well. Yeah. Innovation doesn't happen until you create stress in the system. And actually, it's interesting, in human beings, stress creates rapid mutation. You know, the arrows and the RNA all start to change. So stress is actually quite important for innovation. So, that's a new way of doing research, right? Now, one of the ways we're doing that on human systems, I've hinted at, but I'll just run through that quickly, then I want to move off and finish some of the stuff. So, this is scalable ethnography. Now, if you're dealing with a human system, and these days with innovation, with engineering, with anything, the human aspects of the system are probably the most difficult, the most intractable to deal with. What I've been trying to do for years is to make the human aspects of a system measurable in the same way that the mechanical or engineering aspects are measurable, yeah, but not by making the error of assuming that people can be forced into a process. So there are several things which come into that. First of all, the fundamental sense-making units for humans are what we call micro-narratives or micro-observations. It's not stories told in workshops that count. It's stories told around the school gate, the checkout queue, over a beer after work, yeah, over a barbecue if you're British or Australian or whatever you guys call it, all right? Um, I've been observing different fire-making habits the last few days. I've got an ethnographic background. It's quite fascinating to watch different fire-making habits. Um, but you shouldn't comment on the flat of our friends because they get terribly expensive. Right? Either way. So basically, ethnography, in its conventional form, says you go and study somebody for 10 or 15 years and you watch what they do. Uh, these days, management consultants are claiming they're ethnographers because they read the word in a textbook one day and now they think it's fashionable, right? Uh, design thinking, you come across design thinking? A yeah, classic example of an artisan process being forced into a mechanistic linear process. Yeah, they don't mean ethnography, they mean going and talking to people. There's nothing special about this, right? <laughs> My next Harvard article is actually an attack on, on the day of, yeah, because what they've done is they've destroyed design by making it a linear process. Yeah, they haven't understood the nature of design has to be much more exactive in terms of the way it works. If anybody wants that article, it's very good. Um, so that's what we're working on. Yeah. So basically, it's small day-to-day -day observations which create those patterns which we actually recall. And it's patterns of practice as well. Yeah, I mean, it, my, my father was a frustrated carpenter. Uh, he, he grew up on a farm. He was apprenticed to his uncle to be a carpenter. And one day, my grandfather got a big vet bill, marched down to the school and said, which of my children is bright enough to become a vet? And dad was unapprenticed as a carpenter and sent to veterinary college. But he always really wanted to be a carpenter, so you know, we built boats together. Right? And I mean, he, I went through an apprentice with him, which I haven't done for my own kids. Right? And it's probably a mistake, because I've got 15 or 16 different saws at home. Yeah? And when I pick up the saw, it's an extension of what I am. It's, it's a trained pattern of response yeah, in terms of the way it works. And we almost got divorced when my wife took my marketry saw and used it to saw a branch off a tree in the garden. Right? <laughs> that, that was the first divorce, and the second divorce was when I spent three days lovingly restoring it rather than doing other jobs. Yeah? But fundamentally, tools are part of that extended consciousness. Don't underestimate the power of those in terms of the patterns. 
So it's not just observations, it's practices which are refined over time. Yeah? The ability to understand what's going wrong with a coking plant is often based on 20 or 30 years experience. And I remember doing field ethnography in the North Sea. So I was following this guy around, all right? He was a Texan troubleshooter. And if you know the oil industry, troubleshooters, when they get them, they're, they're really experienced. They've got their own helicopters. They get flown around the world. They get a fortune. And he didn't like me very much. He'd been told I had to follow him around for a week. Yeah, and he, he didn't, you know, it wasn't, yeah, but it was the man, he was the CEO of the company. I mean, John told him to do this, so he had to do it. So we start off with a series of ritual humiliations, right? So the first question he asked me is, what's your degree? And I said, physics and philosophy. Well, Texan engineers aren't known for their liking with people with theoretical physics and philosophy as a background. He then asked me a political question. Well, my mother got a scholarship from the slums of Cardiff, and you know, I have grandparents who are family members of the Labour Party. That doesn't get on very well with Texan engineers either. Then he asked a religious question. Well, I'm a Catholic. He was a Southern Baptist. So everything was going against us. Right? And I spent two hours being thrown into a freezing cold swimming pool and held under until I almost couldn't breathe under the guise of safety training. As far as I'm concerned, it was a dominance game. Because every time I got pulled out, we just wore it on the side laughing. So just the training was not cool. Yeah. Either way, Wednesday, we finally get to fly up to a rig. And I'd never been in a helicopter. And it's a bright, breezy, sunny day in Aberdeen, which actually sounded cool until you realize that a bright, breezy day in Aberdeen translates 100 miles out into the North Sea into a point where I was feeling green, yeah, both in terms of naivety, the color of my skin and the contents of my stomach, which felt like they would emerge at any moment. And I can see the helicopter landing hand on the rig, right? So it's this yellow circle, but it's disappearing every now and then as waves crash against the rig. And, you know, I've got, you know, helmets and everything, it's very noisy. And I, I turned to the pilot, I said, you can't land there, can you? And the bastard said no and waited two minutes. You know, so I, I, I sort of sighed relief with going back, I said, I'm going to hover over it and you're going to jump. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, okay, I'm a male, I've got to do this, so I did, all right? But I'm now on all fours on the rig, all right? And, and the engineer just steps off nonchalantly. And he's probably dangerous because he was into a dominance game, right? And I looked up at him and I said, how are you going to tell what's wrong? I had to focus on work because I was feeling really ill. I was bloody scared, to be honest. And he looked at me with his expression of contempt. And I think he'd been working on this for the last three or four days in front of the shaving mirror. Huh? And he said, I already know, can't you hear it? Right? Now, I'm on all fours, yeah, on a rig, in a storm, with a helicopter taking off. And he says, can I hear it? And I said, what the hell? And he said, it's in the music of the rig. Yeah, the only known example of a Texan using a poetic expression, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> i get my own back somewhere. And I asked him how he knew, and I got a hundred heuristics, rules of thumb, at that point. No, about 10, 13. When I asked him how he knew, back in the, op back in the, the office the next day, I got a structured, <coughs> ordered, logical process. Now, that work has been replicated many times since, and I wasn't the first. The way people know things in the field is not the way they report they know things afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a different cognitive process which means knowledge capture through interviews is a fundamental error. Mm -hmm. yeah? But the point I'm making about that is he could tell what was wrong because he had 20 years experience. And he knew it instantly. Yeah? And part of the problem with downsizing and actually taking an explicit knowledge of knowledge is we are throwing knowledge out the bloody door, mm -hmm. which can't be replaced. Yeah? Now, a lot of the work I did with the British nuclear industry was to map the knowledge assets of nuclear engineers to prove we need to treble the recruitment, not half the staff. Okay, so you can actually map this in an objective way. Okay, but you've got to do it in a way that the Americans understand. Okay, there's no point in just saying, if you're a nuclear engineer, you're going to understand this, because they're not. You've got to translate it into their own language. And I can't overemphasize this. In a complex adaptive system, you always start with where people are, not where you want them to be. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that, that's really hard at times, but you've got to come up and learn that. Okay, so micro-observations, micro-practices, you know, habitual practice, there's a whole body of work on how habits emerge in humans, which is really important to yeah, and we haven't got enough to study that. Okay, meaning doesn't reside in text. 
Um, I've lived through the big data, data analytics like three times in my life. You know, once you pass 60, you start to realize just how many times the cycle comes through. So we had it around the data warehousing, then we had it with 9-11, with, um, now we've got it with what's called big data or data analytics. And these guys, you know, they keep saying, if you give me enough money, I can write an algorithm which will tell you everything you need to know from publicly available text. It's the one algorithm to rule them all and in the darkness find them school of thinking. Right? <laughs> Um, the reality is, given language evolved from abstraction, anything written down is a partial concrete representation of one aspect of the abstraction. So anything written down is partial at best. We know more than we can say, we say more than we can write down. And actually what's written down and available on the net is limited. Internet of Things is very different. Yeah, that's sensor mechanisms, all right? which is very different. But the data analytics is far too heavily text focused. Mm. Yeah? The reality is text is just a starting point of meaning, it's not the whole of the meaning. Now, to give an illustration, we've done pioneering work up in Rwanda and Ethiopia. We've had young girls who have been subject to genetic mutilation and rape. Now, acting as field ethnographers to people in their own community at risk, We've taken their stories, indexed by them, into triangles. We presented the same data to experts in Washington and asked them to index it. And the fascinating thing is the girls, the landscape, you saw the landscape survey, have multiple attractors in them. So there's multiple intervention points. The experts have single attractor mechanisms. Yeah, because what they're doing is the girls are describing the situation, the experts are evaluating the data. Mm. And the longer you can hold people at description, the more possibilities open. The sooner you go into evaluation, the more problematic. And the difficulty with transdisciplinary work is people move immediately into evaluation of other people's disciplines. They don't move into description. Yeah, holding things at the descriptive level is very difficult for human beings, and you have to have processes to manage it. So that's a key principle. Thirdly, well, I made that, all right? The tyranny of herds and algorithms. This is a real problem. So, let's take a triangle. The method we developed, yeah, it's RIP and also patented. Right? Um, so what I do now is I go to somebody, this is a cultural map or a decision map. I can go to this later if you want, but mapping decisions make people make operationally. It's something we do a lot of. So you get everybody to keep a record of every decision they make. Then they map each decision onto a triangle like this. It says we acted intuitively, we analyzed it logically, we made decisions based on principles. Now the whole point about a triangle is all three labels are all positive or all negative. So the brain doesn't know what the right answer is. Right? Because if you know what the right answer is, you give the answer or you, you know, it doesn't work. Also in cognitive terms, this is actually engages the novelty perceptive part of the brain. And um, the autonomic side of the brain, which is the bit which interacts more solidly with the body, which pulls your hand away from a hot plate, handles 20 million items per second. Yeah, and when you pull your hand away from the hot plate, the brain only lights up after the event. Some idiots think that means you haven't got free will. <laughs> but actually, the point is, the brain is lighting up because it's checking if you got it right that time, because it's a, tr it's a developed response of the body and the brain. Yeah? Now, most of the time, we work off autonomic processes. Yeah, we have a limited about 150 identities we can say. It's one of the reasons why racism happens. You can't actually remember more than about 50 or 60 types of people. So you tend to then classify people based on the most obvious characteristic, like skin color. And so it's kind of like a cognitive limit on the way that sort of thing works. So we're now starting to get some reasons why human beings are the way they are. Yeah? But fundamentally, you know, what we're doing here is because the brain doesn't know what the right answer is, it fits into novelty receptive processing which is a physically a different part of the brain, which handles 20,000 items per second and consumes a hell of a lot of energy. So one of the reasons that you don't spot gorillas is the brain doesn't want to have to engage in optical receptive unless it's really got to, because the energy consumption is high and minimizing energy consumption is a key aspect of evolution. Right? That's why starvation comes from perspective shift, yet you are there. So basically, that's the way the tribe works. Now, in this organization, each of those dots is a story from an individual. This is from a culture scan we did, where we said, tell us a story. We're all employees, same day. Give us an example of a decision made recently which influenced you, which affected you personally, which summarizes what this company is like. 
Yeah? So people would write down the decision, then they'd index it onto six triangles. These give us cultural maps far more powerful than employee satisfaction surveys, and they can be real time. And we can do the more story about this, fewer story about that. This company's got a problem because they're good at logic, they're not good at intuitive stuff. And they're not that good at principle decisions either. So their tendency would be to go down a highly logical, structured, linear approach. So now from a HR point of view, we set them a target, this is a vector target. At the end of the year, I want more up in the top right. But more at the top and more at the left and fewer down there. That's the vector target. Because I need a balance. Now we're trying to get people that this is a descriptive method, not an interpretive method. By giving three positive qualities people describe. Another illustration, anybody done a 360 degree survey? You're heavily gained. If you haven't learned how to gain them yet, you probably won't survive, all right? I mean, who you nominate is key. And what you get is this big annual trauma, a huge amount of HR resource, everybody's collecting, but you don't have game, all right? And you get all these pseudo counselors come in, right? The, the, the growth of counselors with inadequate psychiatric training to work in Heidegger is becoming very dangerous, right? Um, sorry, I should probably get personal, stop giggling. Um, what we do is something very different. Any leader nominates any number of people who tell stories about them on a continuous basis that they can only index onto positively labeled tribes. So they can't interpret the leader's behavior negatively. The leader then looks at the barracks, remember I stepped on the triangle, and says, what will I do tomorrow to create more stories like this, fewer stories like that? So you've got a small scale, non-linear, iterative process of change, which actually radically reduces cost and reduces trauma. So again, that's that's the reason behind the triangle, but it's also the innovation part of the approach. So, abstraction is key. By shifting things to a higher level of abstraction, they combine and recombine in novel ways. Remember the Phillips point? If you keep things at a concrete level, they'll only combine and recombine in familiar ways. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting aspect of this, and how do you scale success in a complex adaptive system? You don't scale by imitation, you scale by decomposition, recombination, and mutation. So if we take the Grameen Bank, one of the great success stories of finance, and um, Mohammed Yunus, he got the Nobel Prize, he got the Peace Prize. I mean, the economists were never going to give a prize for economics to somebody who created something as useful as, as micro lending, right? Didn't fit the neoclassical model. Uh, the trouble is, people then tried to use it in Africa, and it failed. And what they try to do is replicate the end point of a 30-year evolutionary process based on the reporting of people who are held to have succeeded. Now, if you don't know it, the way that people report things if they succeed is different from the way they report it if they fail. That's why you can't trust any retrospective study. Again, we did this in IBM on outsourcing deals. We, gathered, we took people to the day before they knew whether they won the contract or not and got them to describe the project. Then the day after they won the contract, we got them to describe the project. You're talking about different universes. <laughs> yeah, within 24 hours, they completely changed their perception. Right? So that's deeply problematic. So by moving to the higher level of abstraction, we move it away. We don't want something explicit. So Grameen Bank, what you want is the elements in the Grameen Bank, which people then imitate, copy, mutate, and change. So one of the projects we're doing for the UNDP at the moment it's basically to get people to tell stories about ideas. And the children of the world is designed for this as well. So what I want is a kid, for example, who captures stories about farming practice in Stellenbosch, you know, from their parents, then looks for other examples of similar stories or different stories around the world, and they, the Bambi, bring stories of agricultural process in the Philippines and in Colombia, and produces a completely novel approach to soil maintenance, because you've got that exactive learning yeah, across different sets. And the reason it's possible is you've shifted your core material to a high level of abstraction. So things will associate and be associated in very different ways. And that, by the way, is how the brain works. It moves things to a high level of abstraction, which is why we're very good at adaptive thinking. Yeah, we're, very, we're, we're doing work at the moment on symbols on that. Okay, so description, I've talked about that, more possibilities. And this concept of more like this, fewer like that, is a huge change in advocacy. Yeah, because actually that can engage anybody. So if you've got a factory with a cultural problem, yeah, actually going to people and saying, how will we be more open to everybody? Everybody been on that one? Yeah. Yeah, you get these visionary pictures about the future. Yeah. What we actually do is say, what we do tomorrow to create more stories like that and fewer stories like that, start from the present. 
Mm. Yeah? Not start from an idealistic description of what you should be like. Start from what am I going to do to shift in a sustainable way? And that's path dependency being taken into account. So again, this is actual capture. I just thought I'd show this from public health. What it allows us to start to do is look at nuanced differences between communities. Now, you've already seen that when I showed you the manufacturing one. Each community's got their own landscape. So it allows you to actually have the picture of the whole, but deal with the part separately. Yeah, rather than dealing with the average, you deal, and this is a key phrase, in a complex system, it's clusters in the tails of fat distributions that matter, not stuff in the center of a distribution. So focusing on clusters in the tail, which isn't conventional, becomes the most important thing for resilience and survival. Okay, so that leads me on to the Canadian framework. Now I'm going to run through this, and then kind of like it's going to be open, all right? So we can go into more detail. I know I'm giving you a lot, but one of the reasons we do it this way is actually this is, and I hate to say to use a cliche, it is a paradigm shift in the way we think. At the moment, People in natural science are saying the discoveries going on in physics and chemistry and biology at the moment are more significant than the time of the Enlightenment. Yeah, hugely more significant. Right? And I would say the same is true of our understanding of human beings. So we're going through a massive phase shift. And on the other side of a phase shift, things become very simple. But they don't look simple until you make the transition. Actually, complexity is really very, very simple. But it doesn't fit the old patterns in terms of the way it works. So I'm giving you, you've got to realize it's different than you can explore it, but it's not too difficult. So the Canadian framework, Canadian is a Welsh word. Um, it's an old marketing trick, by the way. You use, you use a word in a language which only one million people speak, and then it means what you say it means. It doesn't mean what everybody else says. You, know, you don't <laughs> use an English language word, right? <laughs> but also the ability to tell the story of the word matters, all right? So the English, the, the literal translation into English is habitat or place. Um, but nobody in Wales would use it for anything that trivial. That's not what it means. I mean, the English do not have an equivalent to the word kinetic. And yeah. uh, what it actually means is the place of your multiple belongings. It's a sense of being rooted in many past symbolic, spiritual, religious, land-based, yet yeah, which profoundly influence what you are, but of which you're only partially aware. It's a Maori word, which means the place I stand, which doesn't mean literally the place I stand, is the place of my ancestors and everything else. It's a very similar concept. So the English don't have an equivalent because they've never had a place of their own. They've only ever stolen other people's. <laughs> we haven't been given them for the 13th century yet and we don't plan to anytime soon, right? especially with the World Cup coming up. Right? Um, but fundamentally, that, it's a very good name for a complexity model because that's what it's about. It's multiple threaded paths and we, you're, you're part of a flow of time yeah, in which you can never fully understand where you've been you have no idea of where you're going, but you can influence the direction, and you can't fully understand the present anyway. Right? And that's the reality of <laughs> the way you live. But we live every day like that. It's not a problem. We just forget it when we go through the door. That's why I use a children metric. So Canavian is drawn like this. It's not a two by two. It splits order into two, obvious and complicated. Now remember, in an ordered space, there are repeating relationships between cause and effect. The same thing will happen again the same way twice. You can measure outcome. There is a right answer. Yeah? So there's nothing wrong with this. It's actually very useful. And too many complexity people, actually Ralph Stacey, who's a South African economist who saw the light, right? and converts are always dangerous because they go to the other side. Right? Um, he argues all human systems are complex or unmanageable. I fundamentally disagree with him. Human beings have learned how to create order. Yeah, both ritual, through social practice, through tools, there's all sorts of ways we can do it, and there's nothing wrong with it, provided we don't take it to excess. So basically, in obvious, there are rigid constraints, there's a repeating relationship between cause and effect, everybody accepts that relationship, and nobody disputes the way we deal with it, which works best practice. So as you all know, in civilized countries, we drive on the left-hand side of the road. But I'm not quite sure that everybody drives on exactly the same side of the road here, but in principle, we all agree to drive <laughs> on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> now, the whole point about that is it's a social convention. So in the 1960s, the, Swedes, the Sweden decided to become uncivilized. And one Sunday, they all changed over from driving on the left to driving on the right. And it was, I mean, it was fun watching it as a kid on television. That was hysterical. 
Yeah. But actually, after a week, it was made sense because everybody around them drove on the right hand side. Yeah. Um, now, actually, there's a lot of things we do in human systems because we all agree to do it that way. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So, our model is we sense what's going on, where does it fit, this is what we do. Doctrine, best practice, standard operating procedures, all good stuff, don't throw it out. If it's complicated, then it's not immediately self-evident or it's not agreed. And the constraints are governing constraints, but you've still got that inset stuff. Yeah, they're fixed or they're governing. So at this point, we sense analyzed response. We have to do investigation, we have to discover what the right thing is to do, which may be bringing in experts or maybe some other process, but we know that there is a process we can go through to come up with the right answer. Right? Now those are things people are mostly familiar with. Most people confuse good practice with best practice, which is a mistake. Because in good practice, if you've got the right expertise, you allow people variation. You don't force them into one way of doing things. Now the trouble is too many consultants. Consultants live these neat, tidy, ordered lives in which they write reports and never execute. So they always like neat, tidy, ordered solutions. Right? The reality is in any manufacturing plant, somebody with 20 years experience will know of a hundred circumstances in which they might do something different, but they won't know them when they're interviewed. Mm. Because they only know them when they need to know them in context. Mm. And again, it's an interesting experience that. Uh, to give an example of matrons in British hospitals. Um, ma the, the way it used to work in British hospitals, and it was fairly sexist, all right? So girls at the age of 14 or 15 would leave school, would go and become training nurses, yeah, they'd be scared of this person called the Matron. If you've ever seen the Carry On film, the Happy Jakes character was there, right? Um, and the Matron was responsible for everything that the medical staff weren't responsible for, including hygiene. So hygiene was considered a medical issue, not a subcontracted issue. Actually quite important. And then, you know, the training nurse would eventually become a ward sister, then they might become whatever. And then one day, they suddenly discovered they were the Matron. And everybody knew who the next Matron would be. Because actually, it was a socially evolved role. And nobody would be the matron unless they had 20 or 30 years experience. It's the same as sergeant majors in the army. Everybody knows who the next sergeant major is going to be, and there's no controversy about it. Either way, they re-engineered the health service. And the matrons didn't know what they did. I mean, technically, a doctor could tell them what to do. But God helped the junior doctor and told the matron what to do if it was wrong. And actually, it was interesting when we studied this, matrons picked up on a lot of bad diagnoses and bad prescriptions by doctors because they knew things were wrong. But they didn't know what they did. They just did it. So they couldn't explain to the consultants what they did, so they were eliminated as a surplus level of management en masse. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why we've got an outbreak of hospital supervisors. Because they eliminated the matrons, they outsourced yeah, cleaning, and then, worse than, they outsourced washing patients to, uh, to, to cheap labor. And the nurses complained bitterly because they said, when we washed the patients, found out things that the doctors didn't find out. So it was a different process. Either way, I was speaking at Spring Sunnendale, which is annual gathering of the heads of British industry and the heads of British civil service. And it was a rather traumatic event because I told IBM I'd been invited to speak and I got a vicious email that said, why are they using an invitation intended for somebody more senior than me? Uh, so the cabinet office had to explain I'd been invited to speak despite the fact that I worked for IBM, not because I worked for IBM. <laughs> uh, this was the end of the start of a slippery slope. And then IBM summoned me to give me the slide set and to train me to repeat the script they'd written for me. So the cabinet office had to explain again the reality. Either way, I turned out to do this stuff. And the head of um, the NHS, Permanent Secretary for Health, runs up to me and he says, you can't use the matron example. Yeah, because he heard me do it before, right? I said, why not? It's a good example. That because we brought matrons back. You can't use it anymore. I said, oh, well, that's good. How have you done it? He said, oh, we got a two-week training course, and we're giving them a career route to becoming doctors. And he just hadn't got it. And I used the matron example ruthlessly. Right? Um, and the military defense got it straight away, with the sergeant major analogy. Yet it was an evolved process. One of the key things in manufacturing is to work out what the matron equipment are. Mm. Yeah, because they won't be visible to conventional scanning. So even in this space, you have socially evolved rules which give you the predictability. If you remove those socially evolved rules, the thing becomes unpredictable and you lose management capability. Yeah, you you over-focus on efficiency at the cost of effectiveness. You then get the complex space. In the complex space, we have the enabling constraints. Remember heuristics? 
It's not the same thing as rules of thumb. And don't get confused with people who say this is custom and practice. I've got, what's the other phrase they're using? I've forgotten that short term. Custom and practice they use, or day-to-day -day rules? I've forgotten. Either way, there are people who go and find out what rules, the unwritten rules, that's it. Yeah? Uh, unwritten rules are a subclass of heuristics, but over-focus on them is actually quite dangerous, because often they contain bad practice. Yeah, heuristics are not the same thing. It's, it's, it's a common mistake. But either way, in every industry, and the only way I can understand a complex system is interacting with it. Remember the children's party? Yeah, the football may not work this time. Or it may work all too well. You know, football garden sunny day is very different from football house rainy day. Mm. Yeah, the consequences are radically different. Right? <laughs> so basically, until I probe the system, I don't know how the system could evolve. And the issue is experimental probes, see how it evolves, work. <coughs> uh, one famous one we did on Aboriginal health in Australia, um, we ended up actually with something like a $30,000 program radically changing the ecosystem because we did multiple experiments, and the experiments mutated and changed over three months and produced a sustainable ecosystem. And the only people upset were the University of Queensland, who lost a quarter of a million dollar contract to spend two years investigating the solution, coming up with the right answer. Yeah. You can achieve a huge amount by scientifically construct constructed probes, yeah, which is actually a research technique in its own right. Yeah, because in a complex space, you can't use an inductive research technique. You've got to use an abductive research technique. So you're into action research, not reflective research. I mean, you reflect after action. In that sense. So that's practically all the emergent. Then you get the chaotic domain, where you have effectively an absence of constraints, and we act sense response. Yeah? We act to sustain the case, or we act to ex exit the space. But we've got to act decisively. And to be quite honest, in a chaotic space, if it's a crisis, it doesn't matter what you do, provided you do it quickly. Mm. Yeah, it's an old rule on crisis management, all right? Yeah, if you make a decision, stick with it, even if it's the wrong decision. Because the minute you get democratic about the decision, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, I've done a lot of crisis management in my time. I learned that lesson the hard way. So, that's the basic domain of engineering. It comes from those three types of system. Where I say we divide effectively Remember I talked about dispositions and propensities? There isn't any linear material causality. I'm being technical there, right? I mean, causality is enough for most audiences, but technically, it's not linear causality. Um, we divide order into two, but then critically, this boundary down here is drawn as a cliff. And if you move things into the obvious domain when they're actually complex, remember the IBM taxi receipts? you create the conditions which give rise to catastrophic failure. And of course, the cost of going back up there is very high. Now, that's one of the big problems with terrorism. Now, you take a pre-terrorist state, right? What happens is governments get it wrong, so it, it chips over. I remember that in Northern Ireland with um, Bloody Sunday. Because basically, you start with a position, if you don't know the history of Northern Ireland, Catholics didn't have the vote. Everybody forgets that. Yeah. At the age of 14, I was on the Civil Rights Act. Um, Catholics didn't have the vote. So eventually you get a whole bunch of violence around that. The army come in initially, they defend the Catholics from the Protestants, but then they reverse it. Yeah, then you get Bloody Sunday. After that point, nobody told on the IRA. Yeah, if you were in the Catholic communities, you left your doors open so the boys could go through it. Like, you might not be a terrorist, but you stop challenging them. Yeah, and so the civilian population literally, after one day, went from opposing terrorism to quiescent support from terrorism. Mm. And if you allow systems to go through that point, recovery cost is huge. And that's actually the really scary thing about South Africa at the moment. It's on the brink of one of those. Yeah? If it goes under, the recovery cost is huge. But it, it, you can recover. There's something I was reading about the other day. It says South Africa has got to go through catastrophic failure before it can recover it. Well, yes, if it goes through catastrophic failure, it will recover it. But do you really want to be another Rwanda? <coughs> You can prevent catastrophic failure, you just have to change the way you do it. It's not done by top-down planning. It's like global warming, it won't be solved by the creator. It will be solved by multiple small interactions. That's how you change complex systems. I'm not saying it's easy, but we need to do that. Now, the thing everybody forgets about Kinevin is dynamics. Um, this is a com yeah, if we're dealing with a natural system, change is key. We always live in a constant flow. 
So the most stable dynamic is this one. So things emerge in the complex domain. As they emerge in the complex domain, either deliberately through parallel stage to failed experiments, or just by the fact that these are open systems. Oh, by the way, this is the fundamental insight of pressure gene, which gave rise to the complexity theory. Because, you know, basically, if you said the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply in an open system, it does in a closed system. And so really, you could talk about open and closed systems. Yeah, because complex systems are open to external energy sources, mm. they increase in complexity over time, they don't suffer entropy yet. Whereas actually rigid systems, process reengineering solutions, close the system, yeah, so they inevitably suffer entropy yet, they go down to that norm and lose flexibility. And that open closed system is a key aspect. So that goes back to bridge which is where this stuff starts. So basically that's a stable thing. So the way you work is things emerge in the complex space, Ideally, you do the experiments, because then you can see the emergence. If not, you have human senses scanning the data. You then try and increase the constraint. You try and make the enabling constraints governing constraints. And if you can do that, it's good news. Okay? So if you apply the constraints and you get repeatability of outcome, you've shifted it from complex to complicated. But then you constantly check if you are still getting the repetition. If you stop getting the repetition, you move it back into complex. So that's a stable dynamic. And you need to work out what the cadence is for your industry. So for retail, the cadence is quite fast. For manufacturing, the cadence is slower. And I, I once worked on a rule of thumb on this, which says you know, speed of change in an organization is directly proportional to lead time of spare parts. <laughs> it's actually quite a good heuristic, all right? Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a good way of thinking about it, right? Um, so it's rather like riding a bicycle. Have you, have you heard how to ride a bicycle? Well, there are two unstable states when riding a bicycle, speaking from personal experience. Uh, one is taking your brand new Adex bike at 75 kilometers per hour down a steep hill in the Yorkshire Dales after three pints of pizza and salt securely without properly checking the brakes, all right? Uh, the good news is I saved the bike and broke my wrist, but you know, it was an interesting experience. My wife wouldn't come out and rescue me. I never understood that. She was only six months pregnant. <laughs> um, the other one is on a Boris bike in London, yeah, of trying to ride too slowly, not putting my foot down, and falling flat, and thank God the bus stopped. <laughs> if you try and ride too slowly, or you try and ride too fast, things go wrong. So what's the natural cadence, the natural flow around that domain? And by the way, I'm throwing in lots of personal stories, because that's the way you remember them. Yeah, it's a story the memory devices for humans. We remember stories, we don't remember facts. Okay, so that's the natural dynamic. Yeah? Now, it's not the only one, because actually, if you fail to make the turn back, what happens is companies move across there and they don't come back. Um, so actually then you may have to do a radical reset. That's a shallow dive into chaos. This is actually kind of like where we are with societies like South Africa. It's gone too far from a, a dynamic reduction. It needs lots of small dives into chaos to discover new possibilities. Yeah, and that's kind of like a locking. But you don't want the big dive, you want lots of small dives. But that's kind of like a reset curve, that's hard to manage, it takes more resource. Um, but actually that's also the innovation curve. Yeah? You, you've got incremental innovation on the top one, you've got eureka innovation on the bottom one. So it can be useful. Only a small amount of material goes down there. So you only shift things into the obvious domain where you don't need to change them for years. Now, don't get me wrong, it might be 90% of your company's value. This is not a statement about value, it's a statement about need for change. Yeah, so the only stuff you shift down there is stuff which is now so stable that you're, you're only ever going to replace it with new things. You won't re-engineer re it. Yeah, so the most the stable state is actually complex to complicated. You don't want to go down into the bottom two. And what we're increasingly finding is there's a new dynamic, which I call the grazing dynamic. <laughs> Which actually means the overall ecology is so unstable you can't afford to structure things too much. So you're constantly going from complex, shallow dive, temporary exploitation back in. Consumer electronics is like this at the moment. Mm. Yeah, no, no consumer product stabilizes for long enough for it to be fully exploited, which has forced people into more modular-based design so you can assemble and reassemble very quickly. So understanding which of those dynamics you're in, and most industries will be on all of those dynamics simultaneously. But the dynamics are more important than the domains. Yeah, because it's all about movement over time. Now, the way the Canavian framework is used, 
is to allow people to recognize ontological diversity. Different types of systems require different types of investigation, different types of management. The value of Kinevin is now one of the 50 most cited papers of all time, that Harvard article. Um, the knowledge management one is now the top, I think it's number four in citations worldwide. It's because it doesn't say there is a universal way of doing things. For the last 40 or 50 years, every management movement has claimed to be universal. Mm. We have process re-engineering, balanced scorecard, blue ocean strategy. I mean, it goes all of them, right? They've all claimed universality. That's really bad science. What Kinevin says is the first and most fundamental thing is what type of system you own. And most of the techniques we've developed the past 20 or 30 years assume an order system. So they work better. So to start trying to get rid of them, just actually realize they can think. There's nothing wrong with BPR within a rigid order system. Everything wrong with it outside the world. And then actually if it's complex, we think differently and exploit the opportunities of chaos. Because it's an underused domain. It's where you can get whole of workforce, whole of population engagement. You can see things in multiple different ways. The central domain of Kinevin called disorder is a state of not knowing which of the other domains you're in. And that's a bad place to be. Mm. But then you'll actually adopt whatever you feel most comfortable with. So bureaucrats will see every problem as one of process enforcement. <coughs> um, not only that, experts will see every problem you didn't have enough money or time to do a proper study. And so on and so forth. Right? The whole point is to say, hang on, it's complex. We probe, we don't analyze. And in operational use, Kinevin is defined by what are called exemplar narratives from the organization's own history. So each domain and each boundary is defined not by cases, but by multiple micro cases drawn from the organization's own history. Because that's where we argue. It looks like these, we agreed it was complex, we probed, we don't analyze it. So again, it radically increases the efficiency of decision making as you go forward. So different techniques, different systems, different processes, different ways of working. Nothing wrong with what we've done, but we need to find boundaries between us and the wrong. And just to emphasize the phase shift, if anybody remembers um, latent heat, and with engineers, so most of you should know about this. But my kids laugh at me, all right, because I go out in, in winter, and I'll do this in February, come back in, and I've done this most winter, I keep forgetting not to do it, all right? I said, it smells like snow, and they laugh. I grew up in a rural environment. I can smell snow coming. Right? They didn't grow up in a rural environment, they can't. And I still don't understand, but it was a gradual process of evolution, right? And the reason is, what you get is, you know, as the liquid is about to become solid, it throws off heat. And that throwing off of heat changes the center of the atmosphere, so you can smell so coming. But the point is, it's facial. So if you're the metaphor, this is a metaphor, or there is a solid. Yeah, it's easy to handle this cup. Yeah, it's not going to move around too much on that surface. It's stable, it's all that is constrained. If I increase the heat to the point which it becomes liquid, the only way I contain it is by boundaries or by creating a depression. And if I increase the heat again, it becomes a gas. Now, but each one goes through an energy loss or energy gain where you get, the, the state doesn't change until you get energy input or output. So think about that as all the complexity of chaos. So shifting between the boundaries, it actually requires energy in or energy out. The shift from, from order to chaos is a catastrophic shift that requires no energy. Mm -hmm. And it will happen when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. And that's why managing dispositions is key. And managing through actions is key. Right? So a last lesson on this, this is from work I did on peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland. There were two approaches to peace and reconciliation. I should have done this example yesterday, but I failed to do it. One was called the Corrimila community. This was a classic New Age fluffy bunny approach to peace and reconciliation. They get people from both communities together in workshops with heavyweight facilitation. They spend two or three days talking about how life would be wonderful if only Catholics and Protestants talked with each other. We've got more in common than we've got apart. Hugely successful. Everybody claimed success. Everybody went out and said it was wonderful. Within two weeks, they were throwing so many at the <laughs> because they'd actually talked about changing the narrative, not talking about changing the circumstances. You know, the assumption was, if we change the way people describe the situation, magically the world will change. Mm. And there's still far too much of that. We took a different approach in Glen Cree, but we were Jesuits, and that kind of comes from that side. I 
tale that has of obedience to the Jesuits. It's a story of my life. Right? Uh, we took people from both communities and sent them to Latin America for a year on development projects. We didn't talk about Northern Ireland. Okay? And that's actually the way you achieve change. You don't talk about problems in human systems. What you do instead is you put people in situations where they act differently than the narrative situation. Yeah, and that's an incremental, progressive approach. Yeah, and it actually doesn't require cases in depth of thinking, that evolution, that gradual flow of direction over time. And the final phrase of what you manage the evolutionary potential of the present. You don't try and manage to an idealistic future state, because you'll just create disappointment. <coughs> okay. I've spent my time, I've gone through the material that Shaw mandated I should do, so it's all resolved if you don't like it. <laughs> um, any questions? Any I can go into stuff in more detail, we can finish early, I don't mind, but I've gone through our uh, teachers that are teaching stuff over a week in Stellenbosch in November, the management school. This is kind of like the high level overview. Any questions? Anything anyone wants to write? or a particle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's two ways. One, the most simplest heuristic is if the evidence supports competing hypotheses, it's complex. That's actually really simple. If the evidence, if the evidence presented you as a decision maker supports competing hypotheses, and you can't resolve it on the basis of the evidence, then assume it's complex. The way we do it operationally is we, it's called four points, which you can look up. In fact, there's a new, somebody, a friend of mine, Kiwi has just produced a little book that never, I was reviewing it last night, which talks about the method, right? So it's one of those big managing handbooks. Um, what we actually do is we take two or three hundred example narratives from the organization. We then get groups, so these are the kind of key turning points. Uh, turning points where people tell us from narrative. Yeah, so for example, the most significant turning point in history is where Llewellyn failed to support Simon de Montfort at the Battle of Eastern as a result of which the Welsh were conquered. If you don't know, you all know about that one, don't you? <laughs> um, you know, there's a story about how if Llewellyn had supported, Montfort would have won, Edward I would have arrived, there would have been an English parliament, the world would be a better place, right? So I'm convinced that when I'm trying to argue it, right? But the point is, all organisations have those turning point stories. So you find the ones that everybody in the organisation knows in common, because they're forming a fundamental pattern from which people see the world. Yeah. And then we go through a, a, a workshop process which we're now automating by which those narratives are placed onto a space and people draw the boundaries between the narratives and then the space and the domain is drawn by narratives. So you can say, well, remember when we did that, we said it was complex, therefore we do that. So that that's all sort of um, Yes, I've got two questions, um, but, but they're related, so the answer might, might overlap. Um, the first one is if, if, if if you have an organization that, that is either, let's say, complex, dipping into chaotic, and this organization needs to interact with another organization that, that might be chaotic or complex, as a matter. Like three universities merging, for example. Like three universities merging, or, or perhaps a university, a university that is very complex, having, having to, to, to work together with industry in an in a innovation type of, of yeah. setting. And you have the interface of these two systems. How, how do you manage the interface of these two systems? I think this, yeah, the, the scary thing, right, because I've studied this in mergers, is when you get two companies merged, the most bureaucratic, bureaucratic company always wins. Yeah? And one of the reasons is the initial focus is on process. Mm. And the most bureaucratic company has processes that they get adopted, and much of the value of the merger is lost completely. Um, so, for example, when Smith Klein Beaching comes together, you can see the process. Right? Um, the other famous one is PwC, so Pricewaterhouse. Yeah. The Pricewaterhouse was merged with Coopers, so PW were fairly bureaucratic. Coopers was fairly open. Yeah. So they merged together, PW win all the battles. Yeah. Then IBM takes over. Yeah. Compared with PW, IBM is a bureaucracy that they've never seen before. The interesting thing is that Coopers adapted faster because they knew you didn't fight bureaucrats. The PW people fought for their bureaucracy and lost. 
the Cooper's guys just said, okay, what are the rules? I'll get somebody from IBM that understands it. I'll decide what I'll do. They'll perform with the process. So there's a danger on that for mergers. Right? So one of the ways we, we do mergers, and you can do this post-event as well, right? There are several different things. One is to identify the past histories. But the key thing on change in human systems, this is from work we're doing on peace and reconciliation in, in Colombia between FARC and the government. Until you change the story of the past, a new story is not possible. And I've been trying to get somebody to listen to me on that in South Africa for years. Until you change the story of the past, a new story is impossible. Everybody keeps trying to create a new story. And that doesn't work. That's, that's a very American concept. Because everybody joined America because they wanted to be Americans. And America is monocultural, mm. even though it's ethnically diverse. In a multicultural society, you've got to change the past story. So one of the ways is to actually I'll give you my Northern Ireland example. So I so said, I was on a peace march in Derry at the age of 14 and ended up in a police cell. Yeah, because the Protestant police came in, they beat us up, all right? It wasn't fun, I still remember it. My mother then discovered I wasn't on a young socialist youth camp somewhere in Wales. I'd gone to Ireland, all right? <laughs> but this is a family tradition, right? Through six generations, you know, until my daughter broke the record, everybody, every eldest child had been in a police cell for civil, dis civil disobedience before they were 18. <laughs> I did it at 14, my mother at 16, my grandfather at 17. We go back to Welsh charters, so right? it's a long and honorary tradition. Right? Um, now, if I'm honest about that, after that, I was on the brink of joining the I can think of three days where I almost joined the group. Because the level of injustice was such that you just felt there was no other way of doing it. Yeah? Which actually did a lot when I was working on, on the um, program to combat racism, actually in South Africa in the 70s, and on the borders of what was then the Because actually, my story of that is not, I didn't join the IRA, you did, you fool. The story is, should be there, but for the grace of God for in time. Yeah, because if I tell a story like that, reconciliation is possible. Yeah, so that's what we're doing in Colombia. We're also sending the children of both community leaders to do citizen journalism in positions of conflict around the world. And that's a variation of what we did before. So what you have to do is you have to look at the stories of the past. So you get the, you get technique called future backwards, which Sonia knows all about, all right? In fact, two techniques which Sonia has done really well. One is future backwards, the other is archetypes. <coughs> so you go through the past story, and you get people, if you want to do lessons learned, you get people to tell stories backwards, not forwards. Now, this is an interrogation technique I learned from the CIA, by the way. Um, if somebody gives you an alibi, you don't believe it, get them to tell the story backwards. It's very useful with children when they come back in puberty, all right, and they come back with this wonderfully plausible story, you don't trust them. Get them to tell the story backwards. Contradictions emerge. <laughs> because it's easy to lie forwards, it's difficult to lie backwards. This is actually how you do project management as well. <laughs> it is, it's very difficult to lie backwards. You try it, all right? You get the bastards pretty fast on an inconsistency, all right? Um, so actually, what happens is you, you go through the history, that you backwards. So you then identify, because now you've got fragmented stories. You look at what's the common story and what's the different story. Then you start to reassemble the common stories to create a different culture. Okay? You can also look at archetypal characters, because all human story traditions have archetypal characters, but they're not universal, they're particular to the group. Yeah, so you actually look at the archetypes, and then you actually start to look at how the archetypes are talking to each other. So that's kind of like the integration mechanism. Okay? Because what you've got to do is to create a new culture. And a micro-narratives, everybody focuses on the process, they don't focus on the stories. Yeah, but the stories are actually the culture, in terms of the way it works. Yeah, so there's a body of techniques around that. In terms of interaction, you start with where you are. Right? So I think this is the intractable problem issue, that the way that you introduce novelty into a bureaucratic organization is you find the problems they can't solve, that they try to solve. Now, I call it, people call those wicked problems. I think that's, that's classic American management speak. I prefer the word intractable. It means they're difficult to get a grip on. So you find those problems, and people will accept novel approaches. Or you do research programs. And so we're going to announce a series of these shortly. So let, let me give an example, right? One of the big problems we've got in software development is user requirements structure. Uh, because users don't know what they want until they get it, and they want something different. <laughs> And the IT industry developed a thing called the user requirements document. Has anybody seen one of those? Yeah, with data flow diagrams and entity models, which we've designed as an industry to make sure you as users sign off something you didn't understand that we can hold you accountable for later. 
<laughs> now, the reality is the speed of change of technology is such that possibilities are opening up that users don't know what to ask for. So what we're doing there is we're moving, we're shifting over now. So what we're doing is we're getting users to continuously record as diaries anything that I think technology should help me. I've heard about this. Why does it work this way? The minute you get a clustered fragment of those, they start to coalesce in the landscapes. IT automatically allocated their programming team to build a prototype, which, if the users like it, gets put into a solid development. So there's a whole new, so that, that's a new program, right? Linked with that was we know Kinevin is now being used in Prince 2. If you know Prince 2, it's the UK step. Well, there's now a new book out on Prince 2 with Kinevin. And I'm now working with Prince 2 with the Cabinet Office to define a new complexity based approach to project management. If anyone wants to know about that, we've got the, the white paper will come out shortly. And that's actually quite exciting. Because yeah. we move from you know, clusters to time boxes to waterfall, we have alert mechanisms going backwards and forwards. Now notice what we're doing there is we're not saying abandon project management. We're saying this type of project management works within these boundaries, <coughs> we'll create a boundary mechanism, and then we create stuff on the other side of the boundary. Yeah. And the way we're launching that, and this will come out in about four weeks' time, is a membership group by which any company can join a membership program, which is how we get our funding. Yeah. And then they'll get free access to the tools and methods that come out of it. But we've picked a deliberately difficult program. We're now getting a membership for people who come into a university. And the membership fees are easier than going to science research councils. The you know, cost of survey can be quite high. And that's one of the ways that we engage people. Find something which is very difficult, get them to work collaboratively, if we can get a research council to see code funding, that's even better. Yeah? And then you move those programs. And if you're interested, part of what we're going to do with the center is create those programs and make them available worldwide so that they can be run in other countries with other institutions so we can get concerns. I could go into more, but those are all examples. You know, everything I'm doing there, three basic principles of complexity, finely grained objects, distributed cognition, um, and disintermediation. You make things into smaller things, you distribute the cognitive process, and then you reduce the interpretive layers between the decision maker and the raw data. And actually, if you do those, you can solve most problems, or at least you can, you can have problems. Can I say, that sort of stuff is something Sonia's done a lot of since she's talked about. Any more of them? And the South, most of our, all our, all our South African, all our archetype cases are actually South African. So we, we use them a lot. The Absa Bank one is fascinating on straight. Any more? Yep. Sorry. Sure. No. Okay. No, okay. Go ahead. There's, there's two approaches, one of which is dangerous and one of which is more resilient, right? One approach is you appoint a new managing director who takes absolute control and tell everybody else what to do. That's what we call single attractive stabilization. So basically you do rigid, massive imposition of order. Okay? Now that trouble with that is it creates the preconditions by which you'll collapse back into order later. Yeah, a good crisis manager is not a good continuity manager. Um, so to give an illustration, the, the company, we, we bought, we, 50 of us bought data sciences from Thorny and I. And we were told basically if we didn't buy the company, we'd be sold to Hoskins and we'd lose our jobs. So, yeah. And then two years in, five of us went to tell the venture capitalists the truth, and we were the only five left the next day. And the shares went to a penny, you know, there were months we didn't know what we were doing. And we did some quite dramatic things, right? Uh, we brought in a, a really good, Andy, brilliant manager director. He, he took everybody in the senior management team. We all got reduced to tears in front of our peers. I've never forgotten when it happened to me. It just destroyed us. And he picked five of us and told us we were completely safe no matter what happened. Yeah? So there were two in marketing, two in strategy, two in, um, in PR. I was in, I was in, so I was strategic marketing that for now. And come up, we're a small team, yeah? three board directors, two reporters each. We knew we were safe, we could do what the hell we wanted. Yeah. And we did some very radical things. So for example, we knew we had a poor culture in terms of offices. So over an Easter weekend, we stripped out every office hall. And then we observed to rebuild the office hall with filing cabinets over the next week, and we fired them. 
that we actually change the ecology to see how people behave. I mean, HR produces the pieces of that after this, right? So, and there's a whole body of stuff that I could go through more stories than that. But when IBM took us over, they offered Andy a job. He said, no, I'm a captain of a frigate, not second lieutenant on a battleship. And what Andy was good at, and actually I was good at, I always got new things and old things, not continuity things. So if you do a crisis, that heavyweight dramatic intervention, as soon as the position is stabilized, it changed the management, no matter how they squeal. That's, that's one rule. The other is called multi-attractor stabilization. This is what Lou Gerstner did when he turned around IBM. What he did is he bought companies who were successful in each of IBM's business areas. That's how we got bought. And he bought Lotus yeah, in software, and he bought data sciences. We were an Anglo-Dutch company. We had about 110 million turnover. And he bought us for services. And he put the management of the small companies he bought in charge of the bits of IBM and saw what worked. So the acquisition of data sciences worked. That became IBM Global Services, which was 50% of the company. Yeah, the Lotus one didn't work, so they got collapsed back into software and so on. So what he did was actually big safety bed experiments. Now the safety bed experiments were multi-million dollar experiments, but at Lou Gerson's level, they were small. They were safe to fail. So he managed, mainly managed chaos by immediately running in with a series of parallel attractors and saw what worked. And that's actually a more resilient approach if you've got the time to do it. There's a whole body of stuff I do on crisis management around that because it's also, I mean, that's also where you build crews. So crews, you look at them in the military terms or, or an operating theater, People are trained in role and role expectation. Yeah. So for example, in an aircraft, there are cases of aircraft crashing where the navigator wouldn't tell the pilot they were doing the wrong thing. Now actually, that overall produces a better effect. If you, know, if you don't interfere, and you know exactly what the information flow is, so people are trained in role and role expectation. We're now using crews instead of teams. In fact, we're looking at replacing CEOs with crews. There's always a pilot, but you're not dependent on one person. Mm. Yeah? Now, the thing about a crew, if you build crews, they, they handle cross silo knowledge very quickly because when people slot into the role, they behave differently. So you build crews for ordinary purpose, then if you get a crisis, you can activate a crew. <coughs> yeah? So again, there's a whole body of tools and techniques that we can draw on, which we can actually apply in a crisis. And, and people don't teach these. And because what they, what they teach is solutions they don't, take, they don't teach processes from which solutions can emerge. And that, that's the other key switch. It's all about creating a process from which something novel can emerge. It's not about deciding what the solution is. Sure. Dave, um, something that you touched on on Friday with the business breakfast um, that I think would be worth just spending a minute on is the... Um, we have something our universities and our manufacturers have in common is huge hierarchy, diversity captured everywhere in the system, but almost impossible to get them um, connected, and um, a, a tendency to manage on averages. So how would you bring in your safe-to-fail experiments in this portfolio in this kind of environment where there is a certain rigidity, poor communication between layers, a lot of reporting? First of all, a hierarchy is actually quite useful. Now, people like hierarchy. Mm -hmm. yeah? If you haven't got a hierarchy, the alpha males will create one anyway. Yeah. <laughs> if it's really scary, the alpha females will create one. That's far more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. If you're alpha male, you, your nip, nips, yeah, they give a token nip, dog will give you a token nip, and you know you're subservient. If it's an alpha female, they rip your throat up, so you can't come back and threaten their young. That's never the nature, right? <laughs> The point is, you need to design a hierarchy. People need to know where they sit. Mm. And part of the big problem we've got at the moment with matrix-based organizations is nobody has to take responsibility for everything because they can always blame another part of the matrix. <laughs> it's engineering and world. So what we do is very simple. You have, a, you have a shorter hierarchy. And within that hierarchy, people have to take responsibility for decisions. So they can't say, sorry, the spreadsheet doesn't say I can give you a pay rise this year. I mean, you know, the, the apps, you know, judgment moving to spreadsheets is really scary. Mm. I mean, in IBM, when I managed the business unit, I was a general manager for years, all right? I used to employ, I used to get a big, I used to take a low margin big IT project 
two months before pay reviews so I could employ a whole bunch of incompetents so I wouldn't have to give them pay reviews so I could give good pay reviews to the people I wanted to give pay reviews to because HR had an average profile of the pay increase for all teams. Yeah? And I never had to recruit outside. I always had internal applications, so I had high performance. Right? But yeah, I learned to game the system. Yeah? So basically, you say, if you're in a hierarchy, you make decisions about your people, you're responsible for them. Yeah, don't go around the, the holacracy type nonsense. I mean, that, that is not sustainable. There's no cases. It's not going to work. It can't work in theory, let alone practice. Right? Because actually, we evolved as hierarchies. We like hierarchy. But then you use things like cruise, and another technique called cruise is the way you handle across silo stuff. Yeah. And then social network stimulation, which is another technique, um, which basically within two years, I can get everybody to within three degrees of separation of everybody else based on a trusted working relationship. Mm. Right? And that's done by setting intractable problems where people self-assemble into teams based on controlling heuristics with minor rewards two or three of those and you've got everybody connected. So what you're doing is you're building connectivity in advance of need. Yeah? And that, that's kind of like the way you do it. You have to build an ecosystem which can actually manage with things that you haven't planned. Yeah? And let's say, you know, classic, the, the synchronous systems thinking in complexity is huge. Yeah? Systems thinking assumes causality. Mm. Yeah? So that's where they get into the matrix-based structures because they're trying to create a logical structured thing, not an organic thing. Yeah, it is not sustainable. And please do not mix up complexity thinking with systems thinking. They really are very, very different. They have you know, both have value. Yeah, nothing wrong with systems thinking in some domains, but yeah. You know. And the famous thing I say, if you take um, Stafford Beer's VSM model, if anybody knows that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the systems thinkers, the good ones, people like Forrester and Beer, not the sort of popularizers like Kaplan and Senge. Um, if they'd been born 20 years later, they would not have produced the models they did because they'd had better science. We only knew about the science of, and complexity is a science of inherent uncertainty. Right? And actually, that's transformation. Once you realize there are systems which are inherently uncertain, it's not that you haven't done the analysis or you haven't got the expertise. Actually, you can't know the future. And nobody in systems thinking actually could conceive of that type of approach. Therefore, they built ways around it. Yeah, that's where you make the change. But you remember, all paths up are different. Right? What we're doing is you set processes in motion to see what structures are sustainable in that organization. Or you change the ecosystem. That was the point we made for manufacturing. You need mm. to extend the ecosystem to education and health in communities, not just factories. Mm. So you need to radically increase the amount of interactions. You need to make the thing more messy so that more sustainable patterns can emerge rather than let it go to catastrophic failure. <laughs> But that's, I mean, that's another issue, right? So how the hell do you get science research councils to come together with social science research councils? Because actually we need joint funding yeah, for a whole series of projects, and it's not done very much. Any more? Yeah. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you, you've mentioned quite a number of, of aspects of innovation and how it should be. And, and, and once again, um, how, how, do you do, how do you do it if, if you've got an organization like the university that is by default procedural? It's like a factory, some aspects of it. Yeah, that's one and thing which depresses me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I had to explain action. to my daughter that she had to learn to, mark, to, to write to a marking scheme rather than think originally the other day. <laughs> and you've got this system that needs to interact with the system that, that desperately needs innovation. Okay, well, one thing we're working on at the moment, which you might want to take, I and mean, we're talking about this in California, we're, look, we're waiting for funding on this, but California may give it, is what we want is academics to tag articles and paragraphs and articles onto trials. So we've got to develop some tools to make that really easy. So basically, you read something which you're interested in. I mean, and there's some interesting stuff on this. I mean, moving people onto electronic records actually reduces intelligence. Yeah, so we actually know that people can find things faster in a textbook than they can find things with an online search. Yeah, so I can pick up a textbook I wrote in 30 years ago and I can find mm -hmm. something within seconds because I write in the margin from muscle memory, right? Doctors mm -hmm. writing notes pay more attention to patients than doctors typing into computer screens. Mm -hmm. Engineers with little notebooks make better observations than engineers using computers. Mm -hmm. now, this, is, this is very fundamental, all right? 
So what we're saying is, every time you see something, put it onto a few triangles. Because then, when you do a search, I've got anything to write on, but if you can imagine, you know, say I index stuff onto four triangles, and I say, well, I'd be interested in stuff which is in this part of that triangle, or that part of that triangle, and this part of that triangle. And then you get fragments from multiple departments. That's innovation. Yeah, what you're trying to do is to allow people to encounter things at the right level of fragmentation so they get novel ideas. Yeah, and that actually is a more efficient knowledge management system than taxonomy. Yeah, and it's faster to do it. As you read something, you let the students read it. As they read something, put it into it. Yeah, because then you can see patterns. Then you push out you know, issues to all departments to index and see how they index it. You look for the outliers, you go and get those people to, go to have a discussion. But you don't bring people together to have a discussion until you know they're already thinking in a way which can be aligned. Because if you just get a transdisciplinary group, it would just be politics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and the, yeah, don't knock it, it just is politics. I mean, yeah, I mean, I found this in IBM. You, you went to all the general managers and said, you know, send your brightest, most original thinker. They sent the person who was safest. Yeah, not the person who was the brightest, original thinker. They didn't trust them. <laughs> so we developed whole techniques to find them and then bring them together. So, you know, th those are the type of systems you do. The, the key thing is you manage for serendipity, right? And that, that's the key phrase, you manage for serendipity, which means putting things together in novel levels at the right level of fragmentation, but bringing them to people's attention when they start to coalesce. So my user requirements capture is a classic case of that. From a company point of view, it's nothing. Okay, so the users do this, we don't have to bother with this, you know, we, we, we kill systems analysts, which is a good thing anyway. Yeah, so basically, systems analysts aren't needed anymore because we're going to develop past prototypes. If the users like them, they're going to product development. I've just saved a fortune. It's non-threatening, but it changes the space. Yeah, non-threatening ecological changes. Don't tell people they're wrong. Say they're right within boundaries. Offer new solutions. We're now exactly 15 seconds short of designated stop time, so I'll claim that as an early finish. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your time. Sonia here runs Cognitive Edge stuff within South Africa. I'm back at Stellenbosch teaching for a week in November. Yeah, Sean here has arranged the whole thing, works with Sonia. They've got a lot of material and experience as well. There's loads of articles on the website and elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much for your time.